Okay, well, hey, welcome everyone. Uh, for those of you that are one minute early, I like people that are early. We uh, have uh, right now 125 people on the phone and, or on the line rather, and there's more coming in. So we'll give everyone just another minute and we will uh, we'll get started with our panel. So uh, thank you for showing up early and please stand by. Okay, well, let's get started. We have about 100 and it's like 147 people and they're still coming in. So I don't want to keep 147 people waiting. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the third consecutive CPA virtual experience. This is a really exciting session today. I'm honored to helping uh, being able to help bring it to you. Today's uh, uh, webinar is titled CPA brand panel discussion utilizing your CPM network during COVID what you learned and how you're preparing for the future. And what we have for you today, last month, <clears throat> for those of you that were on, we had some CPCMs from across our industry, contract packages and contract manufacturers for the uninitiated, describing what COVID did to their business, the good, the bad, and the ugly, how they responded and what they see the future is. Today, we're going to be talking to three customers of CPCM services from three leading companies. They've all been in their roles for significant periods of time and have extensive experience working with CPCMs. So we're going to dig a little bit deeper into COVID impacts on their brands, on their supply chains, with a special emphasis on contract packaging and contract manufacturing. By the way, my name is Carl Melville. I'm CEO of the Melville Group. My company works with contract packagers, contract manufacturers, and their private equity owners to uh, create more enterprise value. But this isn't about me. So that's the last you will hear about that. Before we start, I'd like to give you a brief overview of the uh, CPA. That transition seemed like a good idea at the time. The um, CPA is actually, I'm not going to read all this. I'm just going to tell you about the CPA. Uh, I've been involved with them on and off for about 20 some odd years. Most recently in the last five, the CPA has literally grown up with this industry. They started out as a relatively small group. Today, they are a vibrant world-class organization and they bring a tremendous amount of value to contract packagers, contract manufacturers, and to their customers. Uh, and it's principally to members, but even uh, those that aren't members, I guess you'd call them free riders, also uh, benefit significantly from the things that the CPA does. We're an advocate for the industry. We promote the industry. And we do a great deal of things for members in terms of education, uh, RFP tool, the RFQ tool, excuse me, and networking. If you talk to our members, they will tell you the number one reason that they continue to belong to the organization is the networking. If you're having a problem in Philadelphia, it's very likely someone in Chicago has similar experiences. Uh, certainly there's the annual meeting every year, but there's a lot of ongoing collaboration throughout the year. This type of event is just one such example of both education and networking. The RFQ tool has been honed over the years and delivers not just leads because most of us are hip deep in leads right now. It delivers qualified leads that are tailored to your particular uh, footprint, if you will. And that has proven to be quite popular with our members. So if you'd like to know more about the CPA, I'd ask you to please check out contractpackaging.org at your convenience. You can also find information there about upcoming events and things that we have going on. So if we can move forward to the next slide, please, I would like to thank our sponsor before we begin. This is for Newlogy. Uh, they're sponsoring this conference in March. Uh, for those of you that aren't, for those of you that are aware of Newlogy, there's really nothing I can tell you about them. For those of you that are not, they are an incredible company. Uh, they're a software organization that's tightly focused on helping contract manufacturers, contract packagers, and their customers work better together, removing frictions, increasing collaboration and transparency. Uh, I used to think of them as an ERP platform. They're that and much more. And also, they're a great company for our industry. They do a lot for us. So thank you to, uh, to Newlogy and no charge for that commercial. If we can move on, get started with a couple of housekeeping items and then get right into the day. We're going to do this in 90 minutes. 
and you will be muted because we, what do we have now? 100 and 172 people uh, participating today. So obviously we would have chaos if we weren't muted, but we do want to hear from you. Today's format is going to begin with opening remarks from each of our speakers. Then we will have questions for those panelists. And then at the very end, we're going to get your questions in here. So the 14 questions for the panel are based on your feedback. We will uh, get through as many as we can. If we're running out of time, we will switch over to the audience questions as well, because we want to get as many of them included today as possible. This webinar is being recorded. So if you get called away for some reason, you will be sent a link within 24 hours so that you can listen to it again in all of its splendor. The uh, survey will go out right after today's uh, webinar. And what I'd ask you to do, it, it, it'll take longer to delete the email than to answer the survey, I promise. So we'd really love your feedback. Just click on it. Uh, tell us what you think, the good, the bad, and the ugly. How can we do this better? These are really, really important for us because they allow us to continue to evolve this format. This obviously was born out of necessity from COVID, but the response to it has been so positive that we want to continue doing these long after COVID is an ugly memory. So please help us by giving us your feedback. Also, at the end of today, there will be a drawing and uh, Delcor will be uh, providing a, uh, a gift to, uh, to one of our lucky attendees and uh, you'll be contacted shortly uh, later in the week uh, by, uh, I believe it's David, to, uh, I'm sorry, Dan Altman, excuse me, sorry, Dan, to uh, give you that, uh, that information. So uh, before I begin, one more thing I'd like, before I introduce the panel, I want to thank the CPA team. These folks go relatively unsung and none of this would be possible without them. Uh, certainly there's Ron Puvak, our executive director who has uh, really reinvigorated this organization and taken it to a whole new level. And uh, this, this format is just one example of that. He has a team of incredible people, uh, Marco Polina, Paige Jarvey, Mo Volkert, and Ben Spencer. Ben's our technical guru today making all of this happen. So all those people are behind the scenes and they do tremendous work and I want to take a moment and thank them. So with that, I'd like to introduce our panel. And in no particular order, we have Ryan Bouchard. Ryan is contract manufacturing manager at Ocean Spray, a really interesting company. And he's going, by the way, we had a picture of him in his bog outfit that I thought would have really been cool and they didn't use it. So, uh, but anyway, Ryan, Ryan uh, I won't steal of any of his thunder, but he's got an interesting story to tell and he has a, we'll have some good input on these questions. Uh, following that, uh, we have Katie, who's standing next to the world's largest bottle of Clorox. And Katie doesn't work for the part of Clorox that makes Clorox. She works for all the great products that we knew but didn't know came from Clorox. But she'll tell you all about that in a minute. And then we have David, who's procurement analyst and ingredients and third-party operations for Niagara Bottling. And he's got an interesting story to tell as well. So that's our panelists. You're not going to hear much more of me unless I'm reading a question. And with that, I'd like to begin with the introduction, starting with David. Well, thank you, Carl. I'm not sure what my interesting story is. Maybe I'll make one up before the end of the 90 minutes. <laughs> Hello, all. My name is David Doolittle. I'm a senior procurement analyst for Niagara Bottling. I'm responsible for actually three procurement categories in the company, um, primarily beverage ingredients, uh, also some miscellaneous items that are used in all of our plants, and also third-party operations, which of course is my connection to being on this panel today. Uh, we can advance a slide now. Um, as, you, as you may know, Niagara Bottling is the leading supplier of bottled water in the country today. And if you didn't know that, uh, it's likely because we do most of our bottling under private labels. Uh, we supply water for Costco, Sam's Club, Walmart, and other retailers nationwide. We can advance the slide, please. We currently have 36 plants in North America, two of which are in Mexico, Monterey and Mexico City. Um, we've been building plants at the rate of about two or three per year for the last 10 years. Uh, so we're getting our products close to the metropolitan areas where they are consumed. You can advance the slide, please. Our niche is uh, manufacturing efficiencies, which has made us a low cost leader. We are very much vertically integrated. We're manufacturing our own preforms, bottles, and caps uh, using injection molding, blow molding, and of course, filling the bottles after we make them with our product. Our product is mainly bottled water, but we also do a number of other beverages for our uh, 
co-manufacturing uh, and, and private label customers. Um, we have cold fill, hot fill, CSD capabilities. And later on this year, we're excited to start uh, out in aseptic processing capabilities as well. You can advance the slide, please. And uh, over the last 10, 15 years, Niagara has done a lot to reduce the weight of a plastic bottle, take, taking about 69% of the weight out of it. Uh, you know, some people might call it like a plastic bag, but we're just trying to help the environment and, uh, you know, uh, and reduce that usage in, in the cap and in the bottle and label as much as we possibly can. We also over on the left there, you see an image of a nested pack. Um, and, and, and this is kind of like my connection to uh, what I do with our, with our outside repackers. Uh, we manufacture single flavor cases within our plants. And then very often we can create the rainbow packs inside, in-house, but sometimes we have to go to the outside. And that is why um, uh, that, that's part of my role that I manage for Niagara, I manage our outside repackers. Uh, in various parts of the country, uh, and always looking for, for more. Um, in, you know, all over the country, we have things that are popping up um, with, with our proliferation of plants and technologies and beverages that we're getting into. So the need for uh, rainbow packs, variety packs, I think is gonna be ongoing and continuous. And that's, you know, challenging our abilities uh, in-house to do the repacking, and um, you know the opportunity for, you know, why I learned about the Contract Packagers Association was to to find some help in areas where uh, we we need some help on the outside. Uh, so uh, that's kind of the story for Niagara um, in a nutshell. And appreciate the chance to introduce this. And on to the next one. How are you doing, everyone? My name is Ryan Bouchard. I am the uh, contract manufacturing manager for Ocean Spray Cranberries. Uh, I've been working with Ocean Spray for about eight years now in a couple of different capacities, starting in uh, our manufacturing facilities and then working in uh, the co man co pack world for the last six years. And uh, my job responsibilities right now are, are kind of split 50 50 between uh, innovation and managing our current network of co packers. Um, Right now, there's just a, a lot of need for new innovation coming out of Ocean Spray, you know, looking for the, the next big product. And so uh, our network has certainly expanded even over the, um, the course of COVID. And I look forward to talking about some of those um, complexities over the next uh, hour and a half. We can move forward. So just a little history of Ocean Spray. It's founded in 1930. So for these of you that don't know, Ocean Spray is a cooperative. So we're actually owned by our growers of which we have about 700 throughout um, the United States, uh, Canada and Chile. Uh, we have six food facilities and four beverage facilities and throughout the US uh, with one facility in Quebec and the other in Chile. We've been quite the innovator over the last you know, several years uh, we were the first company to come out with our first branded cranberry sauce, which I know that you all love during Thanksgiving time. So thank you for that. Uh, we were also the first cranberry company to come out with sweet and dried cranberries. Uh, and along uh, another product we had was the, the first juice box in the US, which I think was almost 40 years ago. So quite a bit of innovation and uh, just continue to drive that forward. You can move forward. So you all know us by our, our three main products, like I mentioned, the cranberry sauce, the 64 ounce juice, and the, the craisins, but there's a whole whole other side to ocean spray. You know, we have uh, trail mixes and road product, bar mixers, uh, a lot of different snacking platforms. So new ones that just came out, uh, one is Cravology, uh, which is like a seasoned trail mix. Uh, we do a lot of food service um, and B2B sales. Uh, so we've got quite the, a large network. But uh, you know, a lot of uh, our plants are, are just the, the large bottle format and the craisin. So anything else outside of that really falls into our external manufacturing network, uh, which is where we come into play. 
that's just a, a big overview of Ocean Sprite. So I hope you enjoyed the overview and I'll pass it along. Hey, I am Katie Godfrey. Thanks for having me today. I work for Clorox and I'm on the global external manufacturing team. I've been with Clorox for about five and a half years, been in the CPG industry for the past 14. Um, my background is in mechanical engineering, process design, project management, um, but I've been in this role for the last three years. Next slide. So I know, well, hopefully everyone on the call has heard of Clorox before, but what you may not know and what Carl referenced earlier is we have quite the portfolio of brands under the Clorox umbrella. Um, my team specifically focuses in the specialty arena. Um, so we handle our charcoal, litter, food, and personal care lines. So that would be Kingsford, and Valley, Fresh Step, Bird's Bees. Um, I did put a, a bunch of our icons on here and um, our different brands. This is not inclusive, but I wanted to give you a taste of our different portfolio. Um, and you'll notice, so you might notice me today referring, referring to it as external manufacturing instead of contract manufacturing. And that's something we do here at Clorox because we really do view you as more of a partner in our work, not just a contract. Um, so that's why we, we references it, reference it as external manufacturing. Next slide. So um, you may know our company logo is we champion people to be thrive, be well and thrive every single day. And that is so true in our external manufacturing. When you look at what we do and you see the numbers here, this is pre-COVID and I know we're talking about COVID today. Um, I'm interested to interested to see how these numbers have changed um, in the world we are now in. Prior to COVID, we were one third of Clorox's volume and two thirds of our innovation. But with all the changes in the last year, the addition of multiple sites, and we can talk about more later and all the audits and onboarding and the sourcing, it's never been clearer that our team is truly about thriving every single day. Thank you. Next slide. All right. Well, uh, first of all, thank uh, all three of you for those excellent introductions and again for participating. Uh, are we going to lose that slide and go back to folks here or are we going to keep that slide up? Okay. Well, while they're figuring that out, let's get started, guys. We have 14 questions and we'll get through as many as we can. So the first one has to do with changes in practices. At the end of the day, you know, we are our practices, right? Whatever we do to get there. COVID has wreaked havoc on a lot of industries, devastated others. We have done pretty well as an industry, uh, both the brand CPGs as well as CPCMs, uh, and we've been able to respond to challenges. But what I'd like for you to do, if you could take a few minutes to describe the biggest change in your management practices uh, with a specific emphasis on your uh, external manufacturing network. Who'd like to take that? I guess I can jump in here first. Uh, so I think that the biggest strain on an ocean sprays network uh, was, was on supply chain, right? And so we all saw constraints at different ports where they're importing from, from China or getting, you know, trying to export. Um, a lead time certainly took um, a, a big hit, right? And so you went from six weeks to 12 weeks for your materials. Uh, so getting, getting our partners to order further out um, took a little bit of work. And, and that, some of that work is on ocean spray and in getting them an accurate forecast as well, right? And so that, that, that forecast kept changing over COVID as we were trying to learn what, uh, what the, the consumers were doing and you know, changing their, their behaviors um, through, through COVID. And understanding what that forecast looks like, you know, extended out three, four, five months at a time, and sending it over to the co-packer, and you know, just trying to to balance that with a, a moving forecast. We found a lot of difficulty, right? Some some hits, some misses um, with that. 
Yeah, I would agree. We had the same type of issue in sourcing. A lot of ours stemmed from having single source suppliers for different items and different materials. So having to expand our sourcing very quickly. Um, I think another and probably the largest challenge we hit was just the growth in our external ma manufacturing site numbers so quickly. Um, I would say traditionally or historically, we bring in one or two new EMs a year. We probably brought in closer to 20 in the last year. So very quickly ramping up our capability, but making sure that we were ramping up in a sustainability, in a sustainable way. Because um, these sites are not one-offs. Our, our hope is not in a year from now that they'll go away because um, we don't see our production volumes dropping. So having to build, build in capability quickly and in a sustainable way was key for us. Yeah, I'll just say that, um, you know, we're all aware of the global issue with freight and its, its concerns. And fortunately, that hasn't really hurt me yet. I, I know that I'm waiting for any day now to, to strike because, you know, we see pictures of what's going on outside the ports here in, in LA and Long Beach. I'm in Southern California. Um, and there's boats that are certainly are going are gonna to have something on it that I want. And it's who knows how long it's going to be to get off. But really, one of my uh, most uh, significant issues that I had during uh, COVID was um, in some of our situations, we have uh, penalties we pay when uh, trucks are not arriving on time, you know, with our product or arriving to pick up on time. Um, so I noticed that there was some uh, just some within the U.S., uh, some constraints on freight to, you know, get these trucks uh, rolling. And as a result, it did drive our cost up. We have uh, put a lot of focused attention on that within my company, our logistics area, and people that are managing the day-to-day -day activities. Um, and that's that's kind of reduced and, and fallen backwards. But, you know, that's that's one of the changes that we had to deal with was managing that uh, that freight within the U.S., Okay, excellent, thank you. Uh, next question has to do with supply chain fragility versus I'd say agility. The mainstream press has had a party writing about how fragile the supply chain is and how if you guys had done your jobs better, we wouldn't have run out of wipes, paper towel, eggs, frozen pizza, take your pick. Uh, and they suggested that this needs to be revisited. Maybe perhaps we should just pour more product into the channel and other brilliant answers. Uh, so my question for you, since you actually live this every day, is based on your experience in the past year, and given that COVID was a black swan event, what supply changes or evolutions, if any, do you recommend for reducing that perceived fragility or increasing agility going forward with a specific emphasis on your external manufacturing networks? I'll take that one since you took a swipe at wipes in that list. <laughs> um, so when I think about this, I really think about how we try to approach our external manufacturers as partners. Um, and so our biggest request always has been, and is especially true in COVID, is for you to come to us with ideas and treat us as partners as well. Um, while we may be the expert on our products, you're the expert on your facility and your people's capabilities. Um, so an example may be um, a site has come to us before saying they could increase our production by X amount if they only had this piece of equipment that they couldn't get the capital for at that time. So we gave them the capital and we were able to manage those cost savings together. Um, another piece was um, one of our EMs came to us saying they could use it or in other products they use a different type of print on packaging than we had specified and in turn they saved us both on case cost and D&D &D cost by bringing that to the forefront to us. So that's the big ask and the agility side for us is to treat us as partners. Yeah, I'll share an experience that we had. So right before uh, COVID hit, we had been working with a partner plant up in Canada and uh, we had brought some of that production back in house. And so we were no longer using that partner. Um, but as COVID came and hit and we needed more production externally for some of our main uh, you know, products, we knew all of the capabilities of this, uh, this facility 
And so we were able to start up that facility on a completely different product than we were running before because we knew everything that they could do. It's so much easier you know, for, for, for Ocean Spray especially to go back into a facility that you're already running with or you've already partnered with in the past because you understand each other, you know all their capabilities, the, the quality standards, the operating standards uh, to get them started up and, and to another product. So you know, having, having different type of capabilities and understanding what those are in your plan, how quickly you can get them up to speed um, helps us out a lot. Yeah, and I'll just share, I don't think I have anything necessarily relating to the external network here, but uh, I'll just share that, as you might imagine, bottled water was a hot commodity last March and April. And we certainly saw the whiplash effect of, of the letdown in May, uh, you know, when everyone had, had stocked up and they weren't buying anymore. So we, you know, had tremendous sales there that was, uh, you know, very early for our season. And then uh, a, a letdown um, that was, you know, kind of concerning, you know, that that it happened as much as it did. And then things leveled out and, and things were fine the rest of the year. But we certainly had that that whiplash effect of, of a lot and then very little. And then and then back to our, you know, back to our normal growth patterns. And this year looks very good for us, too. Excellent. Hey, I promised Ron I wouldn't go off these questions. And we got two questions in, and I'm going to do that. You all referenced uh, development of partnerships. And in your opinion, what, what are the key factors that define a solid partner? Again, with a focus on external manufacturing, but you know, what are some of the have to haves and just killer things that you're out of there uh, when it comes to building those partnerships? And anyone, if you can take that. Well, I would just say that it's, uh, you know, it's important for, for us to communicate often, uh, to build trust, uh, to, you know, to visit uh, you know, the facilities where the work is going to be done and to, you know, just come into an understanding of what, of what our needs are. And, um, and, and it, sometimes it takes many months to develop that relationship and to, for anything to actually come to fruition in, in Niagara, we're thinking, you know, we're talking about projects that are happening in 2022. I'm sure Clorox and Ocean Spray are the same way, but, uh, you know, we definitely want to get out in front of it and get to know our, uh, commands that can help us and uh, just build that trust. Yeah, I think there are four main pillars that I would call out, which is throughput, quality, cost, and communication. You can sell me on those four things, but I think we've got a partnership. Yeah, I echo the communication piece as well. I think for us, um, even when it's bad news, tell us less firefighting long-term we have to do, the stronger our relationship and our partnership's gonna be. Excellent, thanks a lot. Uh, changing gears, the next one has to do with a trend that we saw that was a major change and that is SKU rationalization. For the last, I don't know, 20, 25, 30 years, SKUs went up every single year. Even during the fallout in 08, they went up. Uh, for 2020, for the first time, we saw a pause and actually a reduction uh, in, in total SKU counts, even at the grosser level. FMI actually was talking about some stores looking to do a 10% cut, which sounds impossible to me, but any reduction at all is a change. So question, did SKU rationalizations affect your firm? And do you see this as a structural change or is this just what much like the water supply, David, a temporary that's going to come back to, to some new normal uh, over some time horizon? Thoughts? I think from, from Ocean Spray, uh, we weren't really surprised by some of the products that were getting uh, SKU rationalized. Um, they were already underperforming SKUs and uh, I think COVID just made it worse. But there was, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't call it a, a, a challenge for Ocean Spray, um, at least on that time. But we did see you know, a dramatic pause of SKU proliferation. Right? We, were, we found it very difficult to get new innovation and to some of our customers, I think that was probably the biggest struggle um, that we saw. Anybody else? Yeah, for, in Niagara, I would say that we, uh, you know, we don't have that many SKUs. I mean, 24 pack half liter water is our is our main item. And of course there are some different pack sizes uh, and they're different bottle sizes as well. We do eight ounce and, and full liters. Um, one of the skew changes that we're currently talking about that you know doesn't really have any, anything to do with the pandemic is you know just 
you know, going from 24 pack to 28 pack on, on one of our major retailers uh, beverages. And that's just, uh, you know, to, you know, to sell more and to try to, uh, I, I guess, you, you know, you have, to, you have to be concerned about how much is the consumer willing to pick up, you know, to get to their car and, you know, from the car to the garage or wherever in the pantry. Um, but uh, that's that's kind of the skew changes that we're considering right now is is how to uh, to sell more by putting more bottles into the pack. All right, Katie, anything about skew rationalization? Here, no, ours is in line with what Ryan said about some of the lower priority items may get deprioritized in the future or might not come back. And really, it's when we um, went to skew rationalization if the ones we weren't producing didn't create a perceived hole. Why would we go back and try and fill it? Let's use that space on the shelf for innovation in the future. Got it, interesting output. That's great, thank you. Uh, next, I wanna talk a little bit about oversight. So as brands, you provide significant oversight, monitoring and direction to your external networks. They're holding incredibly valuable brands in the palm of their hand. Certainly that greatly exceeds the value of the goods they're producing. Uh, so the realities of social distancing, though, have really created some challenges for you. I mean, how do you commercial? How do you uh, handle the commercialization of a new line? How do you do some of the things that you used to put four people on an airplane and go do? Uh, you know, how has social uh, social distancing and everything else COVID related impacted your traditional on-site practices? Um, We've heard some brands moving to digital solutions, different types of inspections, video conferences. What what kind of things have you been doing? And the qu the other question is. Um, if you were doing things differently, do you see going back to the old way or did you, do you see perhaps some new practices coming out of this, uh, this uh, event? Well, yeah, I think there's definitely some new practices. I mean, on March 11th of last year, I hardly knew how to start a WebEx meeting and, and turn the video on <laughs> and all that. And, you know, we've all gotten very smart about that now. And, and, uh, realizing that there's all kinds of meetings in both our professional and personal lives probably that we can do from a distance uh, over over these kinds of mediums. So yeah, I, I do think it's all gonna go back to the way that it was to some extent, but I think we also have learned that um, there's other ways to do things. And I, I just really appreciate it. You know, when I'm in a meeting, when people actually turn their cameras on, I always tend to have mine on just because, uh, you know, I wanna be seen and I just, you know, I, like to feel like we're, uh, you know, we don't get to see people's faces very often. So it's nice to be able to be seen and to see others and see what's going on. And um, in terms of, you know, managing our uh, contract packagers, I don't think there's been much of a change in that because of, of you know, we haven't had to do that much on-site uh, visits anyway to them. So I don't feel like there's been any change has been necessitated by the pandemic. Um, we were able to do some audits as needed during the year and, uh, obviously, there's there's been um, you know caution when doing that, but other than that, uh, I I just I think that you know this kind of meeting format will continue and it'll it should make us all better. I would hope. Yeah, I think for from Ocean Spray, it was a multi pronged approach. Um, there were some critical commissionings where we did have some people still fly out to commission processing lines, but where we could, we did do. Um, WebEx type of meetings on a production floor, which is actually super challenging because as you can imagine, Wi-Fi on a plant floor, a floor is not very, it's not very good. So it, it, it is a challenge. And sometimes we're able to share some videos and, um, and pictures if the, if the uh, partner allows that. Um, other times we do have third party um, auditors that will, will be able to go out to the sites. That might be a local auditor. Um, the, the challenge with that is that those auditors might not have the same standards that Ocean Spray has. And we saw that quite a bit, you know, and then when, when I know, COVID starts to dissipate, we had people go into the plant and realize, okay, wait a second, maybe this isn't the best of facilities. We didn't get the best feedback that we could have. You know, in the future, I think that depending on the risk level of the project, we'll still use those third party auditors. Um, but again, it's, it's a matter of risk and, and where, where we want to be um, on those projects. So uh, I think we'll continue to evolve and some, use some of these newer strategies, but I still think that there's um, reason to have some you know, boots on the floor, if you will, at these, at these sites. 
Yeah, for us, we did a lot of virtual audits and onboarding. In fact, many of the new sites we have in our network now, we've never had people on the floor. Um, so we had to utilize new tools like Google Glasses. I think everyone on our team has yeah. used them at this point. Um, virtual hotspots so that they work, because you're right, internet is not that great on plant floors. Um, we've done a lot of virtual starts of production. Um, I don't see it going away completely because it definitely expedites timelines. We never would have gotten 20 new sites up in a year without virtual tools. And in fact, I was able to virtually tour facilities in Europe multiple sites in a day that just would not have happened um, if they were in person. But at the end of the day, it's not going to take the place completely of the work we did before and the impersonal in-person visits. You just can't build the relationships that you need for this type of work virtually. Got it. Excellent. And just to reiterate that, what I heard you say, if I heard it right, it really, in some cases, is not a compromise. In some cases, it's a superior solution to be you're able to do things you wouldn't have been able to do, even though you stumbled, not stumbled into it, but were forced into it. Uh, it's, it's worked out better in some cases. Is that what I heard? I wouldn't say that it's better. It's maybe better from a timeline perspective, but you definitely see more and learn more on site than you would virtually. Understood. Okay. Got I have to agree with Katie there as well. Okay. Um, let's just gears a little bit and talk about IT uh, and not IT for the sake of IT. Uh, we continually see tighter business integrations between brands and their external partners and the necessity for that integration. Uh, CPCMs, after years of doing the minimum amount, have been investing heavily for the last decade in visibility and process technologies. Uh, in fact, we just talked about Newlogy is just one example of that earlier. How has the pandemic impacted the development of, of, uh, of technology tools? And how, if at all, can, can, uh, can CPCMs better maximize their value through to you through future technology investments? So I'm a CPCM, I've got X dollars to deploy. I I'm, want to do it to Im Im obviously improve my situation. What, what should I be looking at on those spends from a technology perspective? I'll go for us, IT really hasn't changed that much because of COVID, um, other than the need for re reliability with the internet access. Um, so our continued focus, regardless of COVID, both pre and post is cybersecurity, um, just awareness and training and ensuring correct protocols are in place. Got it. Yeah, I agree with Katie. I don't, I don't think that we've uh, really changed our strategy although maybe we're trying to um, get it to a little quicker than in the past. Um, obviously real time data and communication with the partner um, helps us for, for planning and supply chain strategies, right? Knowing when production has occurred or when something needs to go on hold. And you know, we've been, we've been, you know, been talking with uh, the Neology team about you know, adapting our system to their platform in order to get a more integrated process with our partners. But that was a strategy that I had been looking at even before COVID in order to optimize uh, you know, our, our large network because at some point it becomes too much to do uh, hand keying information. It's unreliable, uh, there's gonna be errors. And so that real time data um, is gonna be an important strategy going forward. Yeah, and I haven't seen any changes either in this, but I will tag on to what Katie said about cybersecurity. One of our suppliers had a security breach. Um, this was a supplier of an ingredient, nothing to do with uh, outside manufacturing, but it did, uh, it did create a situation of, of tension for several weeks and daily meetings and all that. So yes, I would suggest everyone get ready and be prepared for to fight off those events because uh, you know we don't need those kind of complications for sure. Following up on that, it's a great point, and it isn't part of these questions, but I, I will ask it. Um, cybersecurity, uh, the, the CPCMs represent a vector, do, uh, meaning if there's a weakness in, in their infrastructure, it could technically pose a threat, at least a potential threat to your organizations. Are you asking, I know in uh, ethical sourcing audits, the, 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 they keep getting broader in the numbers of things you're covering. 
in your audits of, of your CPCMs, are you asking technology related questions specifically around cybersecurity? At Niagara, probably not. Um, I don't do those audits and I haven't really seen them for sure. Um, it, it, must, it, it may very well touch on it to some extent, um, but you've inspired me to go take a look and see what they're asking and maybe add that one. <laughs> I'll keep my name out of it. <laughs> right? Um, yeah, so we don't really talk about cybersecurity per se, um, but we do you know, trade EDI with some of our partners and they go through uh, you know, strict protocol through Ocean Spray. They're 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 well vetted out in their security system. Once we go to set up those um, transactions, uh, but it's not usually done at the forefront of say a plant audit. It might be down down the line a little bit in, in a, a later phase, but it, it is done. Got it. Katie, would you have anything to that? Yeah, ours isn't normally during nor like yearly quality quality audits, ours are more in the onboarding process and bringing on new sites to ensure they're set up ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the next one is our one of our favorite words, of course, collaboration. Uh, and we've touched on part of this already, and there's obviously some overlap in these questions on purpose so that we cover everything, but has your supply chain collaboration increased, decreased, or how has it changed during the pandemic? And then, and this is kind of begging the, begging the question, but why is supply chain collaboration so difficult? No matter how good we are at it, there always seems to be plenty of room for improvement. You know, it's like a moving target. How do you see collaboration within your operations and your customers impacting responsiveness, fragility? fragility? Uh, and uh, lastly, what are the, so there's a lot, it's a compound question. What are the most optimal ways that external manufacturers and brands should work together uh, with all the change that is going on in, if, especially if the, especially in case this is maybe even more so for you, but certainly uh, Ryan actually, and, uh, and David, when we're talking about bringing innovation forward, where that collaboration becomes so, 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 so important. Uh, so take that anywhere you want. That's a big question. So I think as far innovation, I don't want to say was put on hold, but it was definitely slowed down during COVID. So when we're talking specifically about COVID and collaboration, we leaned heavily on our external manufacturers in regards to sourcing. Um, oftentimes we would say exactly who they needed to source a raw material from, um, but they have bigger networks than we do sometimes, or they produce similar products for other people with different sources. So they helped us gain insight onto secondary sourcing that we may not have had before, which allowed us to increase the agility we're talking about. Um, so that, that was the key for the collaboration for us in, within the last year. I, I think the answer for Ocean Spray was pretty simple. You know, Our good partners did well and our lower performing partners did poorly. <laughs> which is why it's so important and so important to find the right uh, the right partner ahead of time, right? And so you're not just rushing into a facility, right? We go I lean back on those four pillars of uh, you know communication, cost, quality, and, and throughput, and those become you know integral to finding the the right partner. You find the right partner, and they'll take care of you through these types of issues. Um, and when you talk about innovation with the collaboration with these partners, the good ones will present innovation to you, right? The other ones, you might have to, you know, bring them some type of innovation. Hey, can you do this? Right? Whereas the good partner says, hey, we think this would be a great line extension. Here's a bunch of samples. What do you think? And then we can start working, you know, and maybe there's, there's something there and we can launch a project, right? And, that, and that's really innovation. Uh, easy innovation for us, right? And it works well for both companies. Right? We get a new, a, a new product, and they get more business, and it works really well together. Um, so I think I think that's it's all about finding the right partner ahead of time. And I'll just say that uh, um, in one of my opening slides, I showed a picture of a of a nested uh, pack of bottled water. Bottled water. I didn't probably explain uh, that very well, although it's probably doesn't need much ex explanation here, but uh, you know, a, a nested pack allows more pallets or more, more cases per pallet than, than a brick pack with bottles all in a straight row. Um, I'm finding that, um, you know, we, we have a hard time finding uh, repackers that have the ability to do that. 
And I think that that is something that is coming up more and more that um, I would like to see and collaborate with our, our repackers on is that ability to, to get there. Cause I think it's going to become an, uh, an increasing um, thing that's gonna be in demand to save space on pallets and on store shelves. Got it, thank you. Next one is something you actually touched on earlier, David. I, I called it variability, but a boom bust cycle is probably a, a more appropriate term for some of the products. Uh, we've certainly, they, they've wreaked havoc on supply chains. There's no water, there's so much water we could fill Lake Michigan, you know, I mean, these back and forth. Uh, how variable was it for your firm? And then how did you address that variability? What challenges did it, did it spark? And how did your contract manufacturing network, your external manufacturing network uh, play a role in helping you deal with that? or not? Well, I'll just say that I'm sure that uh, the bottled water uh, part of our, of our company, which of course is the vast majority, um, is the one that had that boom bust cycle. Um, I think the other beverages that, that we do were fairly steady through that. Um, and, you know, I, I think that the, the good thing is that, is that what, we're, we're, what we were able to do, we were already in, you know, building mode for the, you know, building inventory mode for the spring summer season. And so, you know, it kind of just cleaned us out early. And then, of course, we had a chance to, to recover when the lull happened in, in May. Uh, so our supply chain, you know, within our, within our own uh, organization kind of held firm and was able to, to weather it and to make our deliveries. Um, but it didn't really affect our outside manufacturing partners. Okay. Well, Katie, I know I saw on eBay someone selling that. Yeah, I like the product placement over your shoulder, by the way. We're selling uh, wipes or trying to sell them for, I think, 30 or $40 a container during the, uh, during the first scary days of this. Uh, so was that, were, were those short? I, well, obviously, that was one of the products you couldn't find anywhere. But mm -hmm. how did you guys deal with some of this stuff? So I think probably all of you saw the news reports that our, our sales were up 500% on our wipe SKUs alone, and no supply chain can prepare for that. We were actually lucky, lucky, much like you, David, where we had been stocking for back to school, not for the spring mm. or summer, but so we did have some stock. Imagine that when this all started and that all went away. And Candidly, I still can't find Clorox wipes on the shelves all the time when I go to the store. And if I do, it's definitely not a full shelf. Um, so I would say we are still in the boom when it comes to our cleaning products, at least. Um, our other businesses, you'd be surprised to the boom we experienced in random things like cat litter. It, I, I can go into that explanation, but you don't want to hear it today. So that in Kingsford Charcoal, people are at home more. They're grilling. They're trying to create those special occasions at home. So I think Clorox is lucky in the breadth of our portfolio. Sure, some items aren't didn't do as well. Um, if you think about Burt's Bees and masks, nobody wants to, or a lady's not going to put on her fancy lipstick under her mask. Um, so things like that were affected. Um, but I would say we're still in a boom period for us where forecasts have not dropped. Um, so definitely you say variability, but <laughs> we haven't seen we haven't had variability. It yet. <laughs> no, yeah. we haven't. Um, and you? so our, our focus has really been more on efficiency. Um, I wouldn't say cost savings anymore. We're just making sure that um, our operations are going as efficient and as productive as possible to get as many cases out the door as possible. Got it. Yeah, I think we were in a, in a similar uh, position as well. We're, we're still seeing a boom, I'd say, especially our, our 64 inch juice products. Um, and a lot of that moved to some external manufacturers and uh, they may not have been in the, the best geographical place. And when we did launch, we might have to launch in like a new bottle or a new uh, size of, uh, of tray in order to get the product out the door right away, right? And so again, optimization kind of and cost took a, a little bit of a, a back seat while we tried to just get volume out the door. But now as we get some more breathing room, we are revisiting you know, these facilities, the raw materials, the ingredients, 
and trying to optimize these products. You know, so obviously, so we can get you know, the best performance and the best cost out of them. Uh, so it's, I think it's pretty similar to what the Clorox is doing, it sounds like. Got it. Hey, um, before I move on to sustainability, I have one question on this. It's kind of a, a, a dovetail. Food service, as you guys know, tanked, uh, and uh, is just as retail was skyrocketing. Uh, how I think it's probably just is it just tied to the restaurants, or how soon is that going to come back? Is it going to come back to where it was before? Do you see any changes in in food service uh, in in, uh, in food service supply chains? Uh, so Ocean Spray does some food service um, sales. It, it's never been a, a large part of our portfolio, but we do have it. Uh, we did. We have definitely seen uh, a, a slowdown on the food service side. Uh, haven't really started to see it pack, pick back up just yet. Although with the vaccines rolling out, it, that could easily come back. Um, but I'm not sure it's going to be where it was in the past. And for us, I think our foods division has still grown. Um, it's still been in the boom. Um, when we talk about the portfolio, we have the division that goes into your home, but we also have the division go that goes into restaurants. And so the ones that are going into your home boomed, while the other, I wouldn't say busted, but definitely went lower, so they evened out. Okay, got it. Uh Question, and this is actually one that's bigger perhaps than the pandemic, if we can, it's hard to imagine that right now, and that is the uh, sustainability. You know, we're seeing a huge push. Brands for a number of years have had a tight focus and an ever tighter focus on uh, the sustainability of their immediate networks. But we keep hearing from more and more CPCMs that whether it's in the ethical sourcing process or just in, in the course of their business relationship, they're getting more and more questions about their sustainability and what are they doing? Uh, and it's also one of the things that's more difficult for a CPCM is since there's no public facing advantage of, you know, where you're being seen being green by your customers and there's certainly a lot of value in that. CPCMs don't participate in that. Uh, cost neutrality typically is, is a big deal or cost improvement. So the question is, how are you, what kind of discussions are you having with your CPCMs about sustainability now? And where do you see that going in the future? Well, I'll just say that uh, just tagging on to what I was talking about last, the nested uh, pack, uh, that also uh, gave us the uh, ability to eliminate the use of a tray to hold the bottles in uh, before they were shrink wrapped. Um, and so that's, uh, that's a good, another good step that we could take with our repackers if they could also have that ability. And if we, if our customers wanted to go that route to offer that ability to uh, Re reduce uh, the usage of the tray, uh, eliminate that in many cases. Um, so that's one thing that uh, you know we've been able to do to support sustainability in, in addition to, as I said before, reducing the weight of our bottles. Okay. So Ocean Spray has made some big commitments to sustainability. Uh, and while we took a kind of a slowdown or a slight pause, to optimizing some of our uh, current products into sustainable packaging. Anything new that we launched during COVID was always in a, in a new sustainable type of a film or pouch or bottle. So we, we continue to work towards uh, you know, sustainability and uh, upgrading our packaging. Um, and now that we've got a little bit more breathing room, we're doing more trials for uh, you know, the products that have been in out in the market for a while and, and upgrading them to sustainable films or, or bottles. Yeah, and Clorox has really high sustainable goals. Um, in fact, I don't know if y'all heard, but back in January, we achieved our goal of going 100% renewable electricity for all of our US and Canadian operations. And that was four years early, earlier than planned. Um, and so we really expect our EMs to jo join us on that journey. While right now the company scorecard, shall we say for sustainability only reflects internal, I would not expect that to always be true. Um, so have those discussions with us, share the wins you've had, we'll do the same and share any setbacks you have because we may have faced them and how can we help you? Yeah, Carl, just to, to go off that a little bit, one, I think one of the challenges is understanding what type of sustainable films that are 
partners have already run on their lines, how well it runs, what type of feedback did they have so that we could you know, run trials at the facility and, and be you know, prepared for you know, the, the optimization projects. This is an unfair question because all things are never equal, but I'll stay with that. If all else was equal, a partner that was committed to sustainability that had zero landfill facilities that were doing quote unquote all the right things, would they would that improve their likelihood of of winning business from you again if all else being equal? It, it would from Ocean Spray's perspective, absolutely. True. It's definitely a metric we use in our scoring of new sites. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'll chime in there as well. Same for Niagara. Okay, well, that was that was interesting. Next one is something, that, another big trend that's going on that we covered, well, many of these we covered in the State of the Industry Report. This was a big one. I called it labor arbitrage, and it's the difference for those on the phone, the difference between what a, what a labor cost, typically a legacy food or CP, CPG company has versus a CPCM. And that's a delta that's been closing significantly over time. So uh, in, a, in addition to that, there's labor shortages right now that everyone is dealing with. There's labor increased costs that everyone is dealing with. What types of pressure, and by the way, one of the things that came out of this, the State of the Industry Report was 70, I think it was 72% of, uh, of CPCM say they are either actively or getting ready to have discussions with their brands about handling these, uh, these, these cost increases. What kind of new, what type of new pressures does this put on, on your, on your uh, network? Or are you even experiencing it yet? And how, what advice would you have for CPCMs uh, in order to successfully uh, navigate those waters? Yeah, so I'll take it first. So for motion spray, you know, we, we did see a number of our partners were instituting hazard pay for some of their employees to get them you know, back into work and so they have enough people you know, to sustain the, the packaging lines or wherever it might be. Um, and, and to try to avoid, you know, some of those costs or the additional tolling fees that we would see, we look for, you know, uh, uh, optimization projects, right? What, what, what ways can we do to make either the, the processing line more efficient or the materials coming in, you know, in, in, a, in a way that's easier to use uh, to, for, for the uh, partner to handle. So uh, rather than you know, just trying to throw out you know, the, the, the partner trying to cover their costs, we'll look at other ways to bring down the, uh, I guess the, the cost of doing business with them you know, through optimization and cost savings initiatives. Yeah, I don't think my finance and marketing partners would agree with me on the following statement. Uh, but while cost is definitely important to us and we have expectations around margin, just, just like any company, it's really not the only driving factor. And oftentimes our cost at EMs is much higher than it is internally. Um, but the benefit at EMs for us is, I guess, during COVID was reliability, where they were able to give us product that we could not produce on our own. Um, so that's a definite perk. And then both, both pre and post COVID, they can bring us innovation that we may not have the capability in house for. So that's where we really find the value in our EMs. Got it. Okay. Um, David, do you have anything you want to add to that? Well, I was just going to say that, uh, I, I was, you know, kind of shocked when, uh, you know, with everything shutting down, uh, restaurants and, and all that, that, you know, labor was so tight. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I guess it's, it's, it's a, a result of our government trying to do, you know, good things for people. But uh, unfortunately, sometimes it, it, you know, motivates them to stay home from work. And, and that's, you know, probably not the, the right idea. But that's certainly what I've been hearing a lot of from, uh, from my repackers. Yeah, well, CPCMs are, yeah, we're, I, I work with a lot of them. And, <laughs> people are number one, two, and three priority right now. So I, mm -hmm. that's probably an accurate statement. Uh, well, I can back up just a little bit. I have a question on sustainability that came in. You mentioned uh, sustainability as a key partnership element. Do you have any specific programs or processes you can share uh, around sustainability that you engage with, uh, you engage in with your external networks? This question just came in. 
I don't I like yes or no that. questions. <laughs> I can take that. So as I mentioned, when we're onboarding a new site, that's part of our metric and our scorecard. And, and when we talk to that, we talk about the gamut of things. What's your water waste? What is your electrical um, consumption? And we will talk with them while we don't mandate certain things, of course, we would also, we would talk to them about wins we've found. Um, oftentimes we found that our sites are just as interested in sustainability as we are, um, but they may not have the resources that Clorox has. So just having those discussions um, opens up those possibilities for them and you never know what you can find. All right, um, moving on to uh, capacity. And I don't know if you've had these specific experiences, but we keep hearing over and over about the capacity restraints either by product category or regionality or both. And I know personally of CPCMs that have had to turn down business, either going to an existing customer and saying, we're sorry, or saying no to a new customer that they otherwise would like to handle. Uh, so the question is, what, 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 if any, challenges have these capacity constraints proved in your business? And what advice do you have for CPCMs that are grappling with uh, capacity, spot capacity challenges? Didn't see any issues, Carl. No capacity concerns. None All right. whatsoever. Excellent. <laughs> uh, no, we, we had we had plenty of challenges. Um, and and I think, you know, going back to when we talked about the fragility of our uh, our networks, this is kind of it hit home. Um, where so we had a number of sites that did have capacity concerns or were oversold. And so, you know, we we went out to our, our Rolodex of uh, partners that we, we keep in, in, a, in a database and we said, hey, we need to set up a, an additional facility for, uh, you know, X amount of time. And we were able to work with a number of facilities in, in, that, in that way in order to, you know, sustain some of these businesses. Um, but the same thing happened on our raw material side as well, where, you know, some of our really big long-term partners, our raw material vendors, um, we're starting to cut us, um, in which we never thought would, would even happen even during COVID because of how big the business was with them. Um, wow. So we, we found ourselves in a position where we needed to find secondary, even tertiary uh, suppliers in order to sustain our businesses. And, and we continue to vet that out. And I think we'll, we'll, we'll need to do that even in, into the future, even after COVID subsides, so that we are always prepared in case there's another as you call it a black swan event, uh, or say there's some type of catastrophe at a plant and we're at our main supplier, we have those backups to you know, continue the business. Got it. Katie, anything yeah. to that or David? Well, I was gonna say that uh, I, I don't know that I have anything related to COVID on this, but we did have kind of a perfect storm uh, last September in, on capacity. Otherwise, you know, we sailed through pretty well. But uh, in September, we had a situation where you know two of our repackers in separate regions had uh, equipment problems and various you know malfunctions. I don't recall the details of, but um, you know I was on vacation and uh, trying to be on vacation and said to myself you know dealing dealing with that. Um, so it just led me to you know to uh, go out and find uh, new partners that may be able to help us in the future. And uh, you know, if, if anyone out there has an RPAC machine and can uh, bundle wrap bottles in any part of the country, let me know about you because uh, we, we may be there and may need you there someday. Got it. Thank you. Katie, hey, anyone add that? Really, my piece is the same thing mentioned earlier about the fewer surprises and perceived firefighting we have to deal with, the better our long-term relationship is going to be. So just communicate. Got it. Uh, Next one is about learnings, and we've touched on it from a bunch of different angles. There is a military metaphor that generals are always preparing to fight the last war. We may not see another pandemic in our lifetime, and I certainly wouldn't mind it if we didn't, but we are likely to see other major surprises. That's why they call them surprises. Uh, what learnings have you garnered from this, specifically, again, around your CPCM network, but anywhere that uh, are going to make its way into your uh, perhaps into your practices or any, anything comes to mind of, you know, wow, 
this seemed like a good idea before, but we're going to change it going forward now, uh, just because we don't because of what we learned here. And maybe the answer is no. So take that anywhere you want. Well, I, I guess I just say that what I said last would be would be my learning is to um, always have backups uh, to to know about you know try to get ahead of where the future needs are going to be and um, you know that's why certainly it, we, you know I, I I would like for it not to be a secret you know who out there could could help you know do I'm sure we all want to have you know more companies that are ready willing and able to um, participate in in business opportunities and. I think that's what you know. Good thing that the CPA uh, provides is access to that, so we can all get together and collaborate and find out who can help who. Uh, so you know, that's my learning: is just keep on uh, reaching out and trying to find others that can help us. I would say that there's a couple of key learnings that we really took out of this, and, and I think the first is you know, understanding which partners can ramp up when we need them to, or which facilities we can um, start running at if uh, we run into another big event. But again, I think, I think it also goes all the way back to demand planning, right? And understanding what we're up against, right? So once you know what you're up against, you can, you can be able to react to that. And I think lastly was what we spoke about earlier, which is about having you know, backups to your backups. <laughs> Uh, and, and being prepared if uh, a vendor goes down um, and, and you've got to, you know, a couple of others that you can you know, get some orders from pretty quickly. It might not be the most cost effective at the time, but at least you're able to you know, get uh, product out the door. Yeah, I agree for us. It's all about flexibility and having alternate suppliers and sourcing. Um, but I also kind of equate it to if you're a parent, your first child versus your second child, where COVID is our first child. So it's, it's I know, go with me. It's, it's a baby. You know, if you get sick, you, you go a little crazy. Second child, they have a cough and you're like, ah, oh, knock it off. You'll be okay. And so I kind of equate that to this and the stress of it all, the loss of sleep involved with COVID now. If COVID were to come again or whatever the next iteration would be, I think, I hope that the learning would be a whole lot less stress and impact on our mental well being, our mental health, and focus more on solutions than the firefighting. Carl, I just want to take that a little yeah. bit further. I think one of the biggest challenges that we had as we were starting up new facilities is that. Uh, the new partners wanted you know, long-term contracts with us, and, and, and uh, which, which is great for them. I totally understand that. But for, for, for Ocean Spray's perspective, right, we want to keep as much as we can internally because there's, there's a cost to external manufacturing. Uh, so partnering with some of these, you know, what we call them overflow partners, um, although maybe short-term for the time being, could lead to long-term partnership with Ocean Spray because it's, it's so much easier for us to work with a partner that we've already been established with has been set up in our system, right? We, we know how they work, they know how they uh, we operate. Uh, so although even we had these overflow capacities concerns, you know, if we were to start up another project, that would be one of the first uh, partners that I would probably call if a new project were to come up. And so there's kind of a balancing act of, you know, how much capacity and how much uh, um, volume we were willing to sign up for and that, and that was a, that was a little bit of a challenge for ocean spray uh and finding the the right spot for both companies so that you know it, it made sense to to go forward with the the project all right okay thank you this next one dealt with operating philosophy which i think you guys have answered four different ways um, but if it has changed your operating philosophy in a way you haven't addressed yet, please cover it. But more specifically, the second point of the question, as we look forward to the next three to five year time horizons, and by the way, I don't know how anybody can see that far in the future. I think they're delusional, but some people can, so good for them. <laughs> uh, when you look forward three to five years, what do you see as the biggest threats and opportunities facing your industry and the CPCM industry that serves you? So, you know, when you're, when you're, when you're doing, seriously now, when you're doing your, your strategic plan or your deep thinking, uh, what do you see down the line and how can, how are you going to prepare for it and how can your network be better prepared for it? Take that anywhere you want. Mm -hmm. 
I'll go. So I think our biggest threat is also our greatest opportunity. Um, and that would be obviously to meet our changing customer demands. And I think the biggest thing there right now is the virtual spend and the one-stop shopping. So we either have to be the leader there or we're gonna be playing catch up and we obviously wanna be the lead. So any support from EMs on, in harnessing that virtual reach um, is helpful. I think from Ocean Spray's perspective, at least internally is that, I think uh, as far as philosophy goes, um, external manufacturing was during COVID was really seen as a strategic and, and much needed part of manufacturing than, than it was in the past um, in order to cover some of the, the business processes that were, uh, you know, we were over capacity on internally. Uh, but likewise, as, a, as an innovation hub, you know, our, our internal plants are, are made for, like I said, sauce, 64 ounce juice and sweet and dried cranberries. So and, and anything outside of that uh, is really coming through external manufacturing. So understanding how critical that is to the innovation and uh, you know, future of, of ocean spray, uh, I think it really came to the, the forefront of some of uh, the leadership minds at, at ocean spray, which was good to see because we have a wide a network of partners that we work with. And you know, if we allow them to help us innovate, right? That's 30, 40, 50 new facilities that can, that can bring some new ideas to ocean spray. And so we look for partners who can uh, help us with that, you know, in that, and uh, launching new products in the future? Excellent. I I suppose that uh, one of the biggest threats that an EM may see is that you know companies uh, figure out how to do everything themselves on the inside, and you know Niagara strives to do that. But because Niagara strives to do so much, we we then you know find ourselves having to go on the outside to to do some of it because. Um, you know, we're trying to do all at once and we never can seem to quite catch up and, and get it all inside. So I, I'm sure there's going to be opportunities, uh, you know, for years to come as, and, and like you say, Carl, it's, you know, it'd be, we'd all be delusional to know exactly what's going to happen in three to five years, but it seems like there's still going to be a, a demand for consumer products and, uh, you know, we're going to, we're going to need help uh, getting them out there. Thank you. So we have one more question and it's, a, it's kind of a high level question. And then we're gonna have several that have come in from the audience we'll cover. So the last one on my list uh, is some advice for CPCMs. What advice do you have for CPCMs that are seeking to maximize the value they bring you? So this isn't just about COVID. This is, you know, they're out there and they live and die by the amount of value that they can deliver to you. And they're very focused on that. What advice do you give them on how they can maximize that value? I think this is a great question. I'll happy to take it. Um, so I always lean back on those four pillars that I mentioned before, right? That's, that's, your, that's your base, your communication, cost, throughput, quality. Um, that gets you in the door. But innovation uh, starts small, right? We don't start at a million, two million cases out the door. Uh, and so we need co-packers or partners that are able to you know, launch small volume innovation projects but also be willing to help scale that up as well. And so we want to be able to understand how you're able to work with us on those small volumes, but also bring it into like a national type of launch. Um, I think that's one of the biggest struggles we find in our external manufacturing right now is finding a partner who can, who can build that type of a product with us. Yeah, I would agree. And just to build on that is just to build a relationship because a lot of those innovation discussions, you're not going to get the right product out the door, the innovation the customer really wants if you're not talking openly with your EMs who's developing it for you half the time. So that relationship is key. And I, I would suggest that CPCMs can probably um, be more proactive in talking to uh, their customers about uh, maybe making some observations on how how things are going or how um, transactions are done, how business is carried out, and try to offer some suggestions. Or certainly, be willing to talk to different facets of of the company to see if there's things that can be done to make improvements. 
Okay. Uh, <clears throat> now, uh, Ron, you just popped up on the screen. Did you have something you wanted to add? Okay. Thank you for that. Um, I'm now going to go into some questions that have come in from the audience. And rather than paraphrase them, I'm going to read them straight. So if they're not, if they don't make complete sense, don't, don't shoot the messenger, but I think they're all good. <laughs> so you all mentioned innovation being critical and while slow during COVID, still vitally important. Will innovation be more measured and tempered in the future? Question mark. Will new products be more scrutinized or will there be better ways to assess new product? Higher uh, and then will will higher using external manufacturing. I'm not sure what they mean by that, but talk that in terms of uh, what has changed in, in the innovation process, if anything, now that you're getting back to some new normal. I can say at Ocean Spray, it's it's definitely changed over the last couple of years. Um, we, we've, we've recently gone through a CEO change and uh, the previous CEO uh, had a mandate of, you know, double the innovation half the time. Um, so a lot of innovation going out the door, uh, small volumes, you know, see what worked well, come back, optimize it, and, you know, relaunch it. Um, and uh, that strategy would, didn't always work out well. And so now I think we're taking a more um, structured approach to our innovation. Um, I don't think it will slow down significantly. I think innovation is, is definitely important, but I think we're going to do more research before launching projects. Uh, so I can see us doing a lot of different trials with our uh, partners before you know formally launching uh, a project. So um, any 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 copag or partner will need to be able to run those type of trial volumes so that we can you know get them in do like a home use test or something of that nature. Um, but yeah, I think it'll be more structured. Uh, I don't think it'll be crazy innovation and just throwing a lot out there. Uh, I think it'll be more functionally approached, um, really tailoring to the needs of the consumers. And I think there's a lot of learning to, to be done there uh, you know, since COVID started and the changing uh, behaviors and shopping behaviors um, throughout the whole uh, pandemic. I, I heard the word scrutinized in that question, and I'm sure that uh, every large company has uh, a team of people or people are always encouraged to scrutinize everything. Um, you know, but at Niagara, we too certainly have a, uh, a continual improvement uh, program where employees are uh, encouraged to uh, challenge things and, and raise questions and question, you know, the status quo. Uh, so I think that is going to be uh, ever ongoing and you know we're going to continue to see innovations because of that uh, exactly what they are it remains to be seen but uh, in big and small ways every year at niagara there are you know things are scrutinized and changed and improved yeah we have a pretty strong structure around innovation within clorox i would say i, I mentioned earlier that two-thirds of our innovation already comes from mems um, I actually see that number growing as our internal facilities have become more sustainable and more, um, I'm blanking on the word, but they don't have the capacity that they used to. Um, so I see more innovation going to our EMs than in the past and also see us wanting it faster. Um, where the innovation timeline before was closer to 18 months, we're asking for it under a year now, which seems like a long time, but it's really not. <laughs> and can that go faster when a CPCM is involved or does it slow down the innovation process? I think oftentimes our EMs are faster because um, they have their own R&D capabilities that oftentimes we don't. Um, or we do, but they're being pulled into internal things as well. So oftentimes our EMs come to us with a product and say, hey, I think this would be a great fit for a hole in your brand. And we say, okay, let's try it. Got it. Uh, I've got to agree with Katie there, Carl. Uh, you know, we, had, we used to have um, innovation projects, innovation projects that would go you know, 18 months and, and now we're launching in like eight months. And so it's been a dramatic shift in, in how quickly we were able to start up. And I think the, finding the right partner is a significant part of that. One of the things I hear from CPCMs a lot is the earlier the customer brings us into the process, the better job we can do for them. Whether that's true or not, they believe that. Would you agree with that statement? Yes, absolutely, point? I would. Yes. 
Um, we have another one here. Do you look for comans, CPCMs, who may be open to collaborate on projects that may strain their own capacities? Do you need them to help you develop additional partners or do you prefer to develop additional partners directly? Yeah, I guess I'll, I'll step in here. That's a, it's an interesting question. Um, I would be cautious, I think, of straining uh, one of my partners and, and kind of pushing them to what their limits are, both operationally and in, in capacity wise. Um, I don't want to be in a position where I need to start up a, a new facility immediately after starting up a new facility. That, uh, that makes it tough. Um, it, it's always it's always easier to try and manage it through one facility. Right? We have we only have so many resources internally at Ocean Spray, which is why we're trying to optimize that network by using someone like like Neology, right? And who can do uh, automated transactions, real time data um, you know, integration. Um, so I would definitely be cautious uh, about straining um, the resources at, at a facility. Um, it, it would be tough. And even if they were to uh, assist us with a search for a secondary facility, um, I mean, if we were able to grow into um, a facility and then try to reach what we we're able to do as far as capacity, yeah, I could, I could see that happening. But uh, as a starting point, uh, I, I would have to say no. I think that it also could be kind of a chicken and the egg question, um, you know, because they're willing, because you, you might have a, a CM that's willing to expand their capacity, you know, for, you know, for a long term contract. And obviously, um, you know, where those opportunities are, then we, uh, you know, if, if we have somebody we have a good relationship with and if they're flexible and able to expand and we want to commit to uh, the long term together, then that's always a possibility. David brought up a great point. You know, one of the things that we ask when we, we go forward with these projects is, okay, if this project, you know, takes off, right, you know, we're selling a lot of cases, what can you do to expand your capacity, right? Do you need a new processing line? What, what, what does that look like? What's the timeline? Do you have to add on to your facility? Um, those are all very good questions to ask. Let's see, uh, we're doing on time. We've got about nine minutes left and a couple of more questions here. Do you feel you could, I think we've answered this, but I'll read it. Do you feel you could better react to an event in the future? Do you have better plans? And I think we've asked this already. Uh, do you feel you have a stronger supply chain? Oh, that's a fair question right by itself. Do you feel you have a stronger supply chain than you did before COVID or it was good then and it's great now? I think ours is stronger. Okay. I agree. Yeah, ours is getting stronger. Um, we continue to optimize it. Uh, I, I don't think we're ever really done, right? And I think, I think you have to continue. It's a, it's a continuing story, yeah. I'm just kind of amazed by how well everything held together, you know, at least, at least in my world. Um, you know, I, I'm amazed that, you know, when this pandemic started that suddenly everybody in the world could jump online and have video conferences and there's enough bandwidth to handle it all. You know, I, how does that happen? I don't know, but, you know, but somehow, you know, we got through this, uh, this year and, uh, you know, pretty minimal issues considering what, it, you know, it probably should have been, but I think that's this indication that we're pretty well, um, you know, secured and we got a good system going here. Okay. Um, Katie, you already handled that one, right? You answered that. I think you did. Okay, great. Um, let's see. Da, 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 see if anything in the, we, we yes, we've heard from many people that some of the main issues have been getting have been getting machinery and equipment from offshore or simply back orders. Is, is this complicated? And I know the answer is yes. But how has this complicated uh, things, and how have you dealt with those complications? This isn't necessarily a Coleman question, but it's a valid one. It's certainly complicated the process at Ocean Spray. We were waiting on you know, pieces of equipment for um, a, a new processing line at one of our partners, um, which didn't come in on time. And because of that, you know, there, there's a cost to inspect all the product that comes off that line that where that machine would have done it itself. Um, so these delays have led to some additional costs that we weren't planning on originally. Um, so that, that's, that's impacted us quite a bit. 
So um, one of my favorite questions at the end of asking questions, is there any questions that I didn't ask you that I should have? So in the spirit <laughs> of that question, uh, is there anything you guys would like to add to what we covered today before we sign off? Because this has been awesome. I, I, I can't thank you enough. I hope, the, by the way, here, here's what the audience thinks. Almost everyone that started this call is still online. Now that 90 minutes. So that's not me. That's you guys. Awesome. So all that said, and thank you. Uh, any parting words of wisdom you'd like to add to what we've said already? I, was, I hope they're still on because they didn't fall asleep, Carl. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, for, for, I guess, new, new partners, um, you know, looking to do business with Ocean Spray or, or, or someone else, you know, just understand who your business is and what your capabilities are. Um, I think that that goes, that goes a long way because I think sometimes we run in, in, into issues where partners might try to extend themselves or say, yes, 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 we can do that. And we get down the road and we see, okay, well, we need X, Y, and Z part. It's going to cost this much and this much lead time, right? Um, so understanding who you are, what you can do, um, what type of you know, capabilities you can offer, what type of R&D services you can offer, really goes a long way. Very well said. Agreed. <laughs> All right. Well, guys, again, I, I can't thank you enough. This has been an awesome hour and a half for me. And uh, I hope everyone, a reminder to everyone after this, you've just got 90 minutes of wisdom here, actually 90 times three. Please take a moment and fill out that survey link. It will mean the world to us. And I want to again, thank our, our three panelists today and wish everyone a great day. Thanks again. Thank you. Thanks, Carl. Thanks, everyone.